dear and special to not just me, but to our house, to Kingdom Movement. These are some of the dearest people, and Kingdom is family, and these people are truly family, extended family in Sacramento, California. Um, I just honor this woman so deeply. She has been there for me through the thick and thin, has championed me, <laughs> and and um, told me not to give up when I wanted to give up, <laughs> even putting this together. Um, but I just truly honor women that have pioneered something for years. Um, Natasha and her husband, Andre, have led Flame of Fire ministry for 11 years now. And if you've ever heard of Kingdom Domain, this is a powerful, powerful conference that we enjoy every single year. And so they are some of the greatest pioneers in the faith. And we're just so blessed by their relationship. And I'm honored to have Natasha with us tonight. So welcome, friend. It is truly an honor. Oh my goodness. Wow. Welcome to the Wild Family Retreat. Reunion, whatever you might call it, but it's going to be wild, okay? So turn to your neighbor and say, are you hungry? Turn to your other neighbor and say, are you hungry? And then say, pull up a chair because daddy prepared something. I want to tell you, as I was, you know, standing here and worshiping, God just showed me like a big table. And he just says, I have a room for every single person that is in this room right now. Just tell them to pull up a chair. Okay? And another thing he told me, to tell you that... Um, can you just be vulnerable? Can you just tell them if you have some allergies, if you are lactose intolerant, if you are allergic to fish, if you are allergic to milk, would you just be vulnerable and tell him how it is? Because he has a meal just for you and he has it specially catered for you today. But you have to be vulnerable to receive it. And, you know, I love what Pastor, uh, Pastor Roman said that, um, you know, you have to take off your sandals when God said to, Joseph, uh, to um, Moses and to um, Joshua. And as he said that, I really heard God speak like, would you just lay things down? And number one, what I want you to lay down is your experience. And, and in other words... What it means is like, would you take off your sandals? Would you not trace your dirt on my carpet? Would you just leave everything behind? Your experience, what you thought of me, what you thought of the kingdom, what you thought of your calling, what you thought who you were. Would you just leave everything behind? Would you just not trace that dirt to his carpet because he has something new for you today? He wants to speak something fresh to you today and to uh, be able to receive that revelation you have to strip things down lay things down lay your titles whatever you are doing maybe you're a pastor maybe you're a leader whoever you are you are a daughter first of all and he has something new and fresh for you today so just lay it down strip it down open up your heart and receive amen come on somebody I am so honored to be here. I am so honored to be here with my friends, Anastasia, Vic, Roman, Sophia, Serge, Ali, Marge. Where's your husband? Okay, okay. Guys, this is so incredible and amazing. We just had a wild retreat um, in Sacramento. Anastasia um, came with Marge and it was incredible. 
And number one thing, girls were really set free. They really experienced Jesus. And the reason why they did that is because they were vulnerable. They, will, they were open and they received. So today I want to talk to you about something that is, I think, the fastest growing crime. And um, not only in the world, but in the church today. And my message today that I want to share with you is identity theft or identity crisis. You know that this, this term um, started in 1964, that identity theft or identity crisis or identity, um, it started in 1964. But let me tell you, before that, it started way long ago in the Garden of Eden when the enemy came and said, hey, did God really say? And in that garden, he stripped that identity. He stole that identity from Adam and Eve. And it's still happening today, even when Christ redeemed it. So the first identity theft that happened in the garden. Identity drives motivation. Motivation drives action. And action drives result. For example, if somebody speeds down the highway at 100 miles an hour, chances are I am not going to go and chase them down and stop them and issue them a ticket. And the reason why is that I, I do not carry the identity of a policeman, right? But now if a policeman will be driving by and if they will see them, they will go and chase them down and they will take action and they will issue them a ticket because they carry that identity of a policeman, and today, body of Christ is inactive because the identity been stolen from them and it's been redeemed and it's been returned, but we are still not walking in it. So we will always behave consistently with the way we see ourselves. If I think wrong, I cannot live right. Okay? You will either live up or live down to whatever you believe about yourself. And I want to open up uh, Genesis 37 with you guys. We're going to read a story. And when I was preparing for this word and I was praying and I said, God, what do you want to speak to your daughters and your sons today? God took me into Genesis and this is a well-known story about Joseph. And you might say, what does Joseph have to do with this? Let's see. Let's open Genesis 37, 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, the chef across and stood upright. And behold, your chefs gather around it and bow down to my chef. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream, for his words. And uh, in verse 30, in verse 11, and his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in his mind. Now, 
verse 18. Let me just, there's so much to read, so let me just tell you what happened in my own words. Um, So the father sends uh, Joseph to go and check on his brothers. And he goes, and the brothers see him. And look what they say of him. So, uh, verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many collars that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Now let's go to um, verse, let's go to Genesis 39. And again, then they sold him. And um, then he was in uh, Potiphar's house. And he was serving him. And in verse 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all of that he did to succeed in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Now, he had a wife that saw Joseph and he was um, handsome and she wanted to seduce him so he would sleep with her. But he did not. He ran away and she accused him of rape. And then they throw him into prison for two years. And he got, uh, he was sold when he was 17 years old. And uh, later on in the story, you're going to see that he became a ruler, um, second, in Egypt. Why Joseph? Number one problem that Joseph had is that he was deeply loved by his father. All the troubles that he was facing is because he was deeply loved by his father. And you know that when you are deeply loved, you are confident. So he had confidence to come to his older brothers and tell them about the dream. He was confident enough to say, hey, look what happened. This is what I dreamt. And this is what happened. He was also deeply loved. So when the father asked him to go and visit the brothers that he knew did not feel well about him, he had no problems running errands for his father because he knew that he was deeply loved. He was secured. Even though the brothers disliked him. Also, he had strength to endure when they sell him into slavery and nowhere in the bible do i find that he was crying he was weeping he was upset and uh he was throwing a fit he was you know laying on the floor saying god where are you why did this happen to me you will not find that in the bible about joseph they sell him into slavery his brothers those that he trusts the people that should love him, they sell him into slavery. And then after that, he is um, doing everything what he needs to do. He still fears the Lord. And God's favor is upon his life. And it's evident to everyone around. And then a woman tries to sleep with him. But yet he's a man of integrity. He says no, he runs away, and then he is being wrongly accused and thrown into prison. And even in the prison, he was still faithful to God. I don't find him crying, weeping, saying, God, where are you in the prison? He interprets a, dr- interprets a dream, and they forget about him. He was in prison for two years, wrongly accused. He was able to keep his integrity 
when he had success. His identity was not tied to his success. His identity was not tied to what he had in possession. His identity was not tied to that. But Joseph could love deep because he knew he was deeply loved. So when his brothers came and he, when he recognized that it was his brother, this is the only time you find in the Bible that Joseph wept. It wasn't because he was in trouble. It wasn't because he had issues. It was not because of any of the things he had to endure for 13 years. It had nothing to do with that. He wept because he deeply loved his family. He, he could forgive because he was deeply loved. He could stand and look them in the eye and forgive them because he was deeply loved. Now look at his brothers. I already read that when they heard about the dream, when they saw that the father loved, loved Joseph, they were disturbed. They were upset. They hated him. They were angry with him. And they thought for a moment that if they will get rid of um, Joseph, they will be loved. The father would notice them. But when they brought that rope that they stripped from Joseph home, his father was deeply grieving. And I want to tell you today that there are many sons and daughters in church that are still behaving like orphans that are looking at their neighbors and saying or thinking, hey, just because they are seen and I am not, just because they sing better than me, just because they preach better than me, just because they have more favor with people than me, I need to stay away from them. I can betray them. I can turn my back on them. And maybe, just maybe then I will have more favor with people. I will have more favor with the Father. But God says you are loved just the way you are. You are loved because you are my daughter. You are loved because you are my son. Not because for what you do. Not because for your possessions. You are loved because of who you are and what I did for you on the cross. So there are many orphans in the body of Christ, in leadership, behaving. They are sons, but they are behaving like orphans. Have you ever looked at your fellow sister and thought, man, I am intimidated by her. Friend, let me tell you, it's not intimidation, it's a spirit. It's a spirit that you do not think you're good enough. That you think that someone else is better. That the father likes them better. He gave them more giftings. He gave them more talents. But somehow, somewhere, he did not give you something. Intimidation is not from the Lord. And also it says that they had no peace. When you walk in, into a room with your sisters and uh, or you sing on one stage or you serve in one ministry or you serve somewhere if you walk into that room and you have no peace because people treat them better than you because there are more favor in their life that you think there's more favor you don't understand that there is a price you look at them and you think you have no peace this is a spirit of an orphan. This is not from the Lord. This is identity crisis. And that's why church today is struggling. Because orphans give birth to orphans. Orphans raise up orphans. They raise up people just like themselves. But Joseph was deeply loved. The reason why he could endure what he endured is because he was deeply loved by the Father. I want to talk to you about your identity in Christ. I want to talk to you that your identity should be deeply rooted in the love of God for you. 
not in in um, your love for God but the moment you have revelation about how much the father loves you the moment you get a revelation that you are deeply loved then you can walk through the shadows of the of the death that you can look back and say I can endure this I can go through this because I am deeply loved I am not gonna ask questions I am not gonna cry but I'm gonna keep my head high and I'm gonna go and do what God is calling me to do I'm gonna stand my ground I'm gonna be a woman of integrity I'm gonna be a man of integrity I'm gonna walk the walk I'm gonna talk the talk I am not gonna back down I am not gonna compromise because I am deeply loved by my father you know John says about himself discipled that Jesus loved and you know what happened when Jesus was dying on the cross he was the only one at the foot of the cross. See, when you know that you are deeply loved, you can stare you can stare right in the eye of your troubles you can stare right in the eye of your temptation and you're not gonna run away you're not gonna scatter but because you know you are deeply loved you will always find yourself at the foot of the cross you know why Jesus could endure what he endured because he heard from God this is my beloved son the reason why you cannot endure some troubles, the reason why when you walk and you stumble, the reason why when there are obstacles in your way, the reason why when somebody looks at you funny, the reason why when somebody judges you, when somebody says something's wrong with you, you run away, you start crying, you go in your secret room or you run to your neighbor, you run to your sister and you start complaining, you start looking down at them. That is the reason, the reason why that you are lacking a revelation about how deep the father loves you because when you get that fresh revelation about how the father loves you you will stare the trouble right in the eye and you're gonna say bring it on bring it on I know my father is in me he is with me he is for me and not against me this is the only reason why you can endure what you need to endure and let me tell you friend if they tell you that you will not run into trouble just because you're a believer then they might be heading in the same direction as the devil because if you're not you're gonna bump in, bump into the devil okay you're gonna bump into him you're gonna bump in okay you're gonna butt heads because you are going in the opposite direction but if there is no trouble in your life there may be you should look back and see where you're going then maybe you should look back and see if you're just flowing with the same direction if you're just this dead fish that is just flowing because if you're life you're gonna swim upstream you're gonna go where God is calling you to go you're gonna go to uncomfortable places it doesn't matter that no one's going maybe your sister is being called to Hawaii but God is calling you to Africa when there is no water but hey it's not gonna matter because if God is with you if God is calling you if you know that you are deeply loved then you're gonna say whatever you send me I will go whatever you tell me I will do because if you know that you are deeply loved, then you can deeply love. You cannot love if you have not received that love from Jesus. You can't. It's you can try, you can strive. That's why in the church, the love of, of God is all about like doing, you know. If you love God, then you will do this. If you love God, then you will do this. And if you really love God, then you will do this. But if you don't do those things, then all of a sudden you feel guilty and you feel like you don't love God as much as not my neighbor loves God. But God says, no, you did not receive a true revelation about how deeply I love you because if you receive this revelation about how much I love you then you will be unstoppable 
you will be unshakable. You will be a real threat to the enemy because he will know that no matter what he throws your way, no matter what happens in your life, you will not be shaken and you will not be moved because God is for you. He is in you and he is with you. You know, some people tell me, um, and I thought for many years, maybe I'm just a strong person. And I remember I was talking to Anastasia. She's like, girl, you're not a strong person. Uh, it's, it's the Lord in you. And she really got me thinking because there were so many things that I had to endure in my life. So many things. And somehow I came out better from them. My parents, my biological mom and dad, they were divorced three times and... I was abused as a child and, and, um, and my mom died from cancer and my first baby died and, and, and all of these things happen. And, and when people come in contact with me, one of the questions they ask is like, well, so your mom died from cancer. How can you pray for others? Like, do you still have faith? I'm like, what do you mean do I, do I still have faith? I am more angry right now at this cancer than I have ever been. Because if you know how much the Father loves you, if you have a revelation about a deep love that the Father has for you, then when in the time of trouble, you are not going to run away from your loving daddy. You're going to run straight to his arms. But if you run away from the Father, when... There are opposition or trouble or if, if you thought you had a bad life, I mean, look at Joseph. That's a messed up life. And he was a good guy. Undeserving. And yes, bad things do happen to good people. He had bad uh, 13 years. It wasn't a day. It wasn't a season. As if we're meeting some people like, oh, I'm just going through a tough season. I'm just so sad and I'm just crying. It's a very bad season. He had 13 years of a bad season. That's a decade. It's no longer a season. But somehow, you don't see him crying about it. Somehow, he does not compromise. Somehow, he still keeps his integrity. Somehow, the favor of God just follows his life. See, if you know that you are deeply loved, and that's, that is where your foundation should be, and that's, that's where you should be rooted in, is, is his love. And if you know that you are deeply loved, then you're not going to compromise. Because you know that those who love the Lord, all things will work together for your good. So he does not compromise. But yet, sometimes we do. And when I think about it, and even when I said, when I was talking to Anastasia, like, maybe I'm not a strong person. So I started analyzing my life, and the Lord really spoke to me that in the time of trouble, the way you react towards God, because some people say, hey, I'm angry at God because he took away my loved one. Or, or, or because sickness, uh, you know, struck my home. Or because I, I cannot have children. Or many other things. Or, or I cannot get married. Or whatever it might be. Or I, I lost everything. I lost my business. And then they say, hey, I am mad at God. And see what God showed me that in the moment of trouble... It just reveals who you think God truly is. You can say that you love God all you want. And you can say that he is your best friend. He is my buddy. You know, we like, we're together. Everything's good. But the way you behave and what you speak in the moment of trouble, it just reveals what was already in your heart. What was already in your heart about your father? Because like I already said, in a moment of trouble, I run to my daddy, not away from him. And look what Joseph says at the end. When he has children. 
I love what he said. In uh, Genesis 41, verse 51, Joseph call, uh, called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. You know that in the land of your affliction, you can still be fruitful. In the land of your troubles, you can still bear fruit. Because let me tell you, friend, the enemy can control the circumstances. He can send things your way. But he cannot control the fruit that you can produce in those moments. If you are rooted in the love of God, then whatever happens in your life, you will still go through it and you will still bear fruit. That's why he's angry when people are really realizing who they are in Christ and how much the Father loves them. They are dangerous for the kingdom of the enemy. But if we don't know and we behave like those brothers... And we start hating one another. We start tearing one another down. We come up to the person that is sharing their dream. Their God-given dream. And we come up and we strip down those robes that the Father put on them. And we think somehow if we throw that person to the pit. If we talk back about them. Or if we say something bad. That somehow things will be better in our life. But nothing changes. You become more bitter and bitter and bitter. But the favor of God will still be upon that person's life. You can strip all you want. You can talk all you want. But the Father is the one who controls the favor. You can be in prison and still walk in, in his favor. You can be walking through some afflictions and still walk in God's favor. Because wherever Joseph went, the favor of God followed his life. And he was successful in the prison. He was su successful in the Pharaoh's house. He was successful everywhere he went. Because the circumstances do not matter. What favor of God can do in your life, no circumstances can. No money can buy. No people can do what favor of God can do in your life. Nothing and no one can ever do that for you. So sometimes if you walk through some afflictions, if you walk through, through, some, through some prisons, if you walk through some dark moments in your life and you think, well, I am unseen and, and no one sees me. And why is this happening to me? I tell you, my friend, you need to get back to your praying closet and you need to say, Lord, reveal how you love me. God, show me how deeply your love is for me. Show me how deeply you love me. God, reveal that to me because this is the only thing that will hold you in the moment of your affliction it's not going to be no words it's not going to be no pretty phrases it's not going to be no one-liners it's not going to be none of that because when you're walking through some waters when you're walking through fire when you're walking through some things some bad things when you stare death in the eye there's not going to be no one-liners that you want to hear you don't want you don't want people to come up and say everything's going to be all right the only thing that is going to hold you in that moment is God's love for you the only thing that is going to hold you at the foot of the cross it's when you get that revelation how deeply the father loves you nothing else nothing else nothing else nothing else focusing on God's love for you brings you into his grace when we focus on his love for us it brings us into the grace the love of men instills fear. But being a man pleaser will only keep you in bondage. The love of God is freedom. When you understand how deeply God loves you, you can walk in freedom just like Joseph did. He was able to share his dreams. He was able to run errands for his father. He was able to go to those that hated him because he knew he was deeply loved. 
But sometimes we come to the father when he's asking something of us. And we're like, um, yeah, did you hear what he said about me? Uh, I'm not going. And the Lord's like, hey, can you come up to your sister and say this encouraging word? Uh, uh, yeah, no. Last week, she called my friend and she said this and this and this about me. See, when you know that the father loves you deeply, you don't have a problem running errands for him. Because you're just a messenger. It does not matter. It does not matter who God sends you to. You're just a messenger. You're important, but not that important. You're just a messenger of God. Joseph had no issues running errands for his father. Absolutely none. Maybe he thought he was better than that because he was deeply loved. He had a nice rope. But when his father called him and said, hey, can you go and check on your brothers? It was not below his service. He still went and he still did it. But see, an orphan spirit will try to go and rip those ropes out of the sons. And that's why you see a lot of commotion right now a lot of things happening in the body of Christ and a lot of tearing down happening oh you're not from my denomination uh yeah that coat is coming down oh oh really you think that God speaks to you and he shows you this and he speaks to you in this way he gives you dreams and vision yeah nope that coat is coming down you're younger than me you're a female you're a male whatever it might be that rope is coming down and see in the body of Christ there's a lot of tearing down happening right now there's a lot of tearing down and not building up and God says this must stop in the name of Jesus this must stop because I want to build my house I want to build my house and I need sons and daughters that will do that because only sons and daughters can build orphans can tear down orphans care only about themselves but sons and daughters look at others and say hey I got you eat my bread eat my last meal that's okay because God's got me I am connected to the source and I know that maybe if God is not elevating me but he is elevating you right now I'm gonna stand in this season and I'm gonna rejoice with you because only sons and daughters can rejoice orphans will tear down and see what God really spoke to me about this season is that there's a lot a lot of tearing down happening and understanding God's love it's so vital in this moment because it will empower you to say no to the lies and attacks of the enemy see to say no to the lie you have to know the truth and to know the truth you have to abide in his word and to abide in his word you have to put time aside to do that Sometimes you think you can just reject a lie. How do you know that it's a lie if you don't know the truth? So some people come to me and, and tell me, hey, I have this prophetic word and God spoke to me this and that. And I'm like, how often do you read the word? Like, well, yeah, but you know, so yeah. And I had this dream and I'm like, let's look, come back. Let's come back. Let's, how often do you read the word? Well, um, I, I do like, you know, like my, my plan and I'm like, uh, just a verse a day keeps the devil away. It does not work in this time and age. Okay. It does not work right now. You need to abide to be able to say, this is a lie and this is a truth. This is a lie and this is the truth. Because, you know, knowing what, what, what is a lie, you know, the, the enemy is so tricky. It's knowing not between something bad and good. It's knowing about or discerning between something good and great. Because Eve saw the fruit and it was good. So knowing the word, you will be able to discern between truth and almost truth. To say no to the lie, you need to be able to know the truth. And um, let me show you one more scripture in Matthew 16, 13. It 
Matthew 16, 13. So now that Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And God stopped me here and he said, see, many of us often live by someone else's opinion of who Jesus is, of who God is. That's why I told you in the beginning, when you come into his presence, take off your sandals. Don't trace your dirt on God's carpet because he wants to reveal you who he truly is. He wants to reveal you his love for you. See, you cannot, you can get information about who God is, but to have a revelation, it takes the Holy Spirit to speak into your spirit of who he is. And the moment Peter gets that revelation of who he is, that is the moment that Jesus says, well, now I'm going to tell you who you are. See, many of us, we're running after our identity. We want to find ourselves. We want to see what God, I want to know who I am. And many are on the journey of finding ourselves. But God says, you will never find yourself apart from me. Because the only true God, the creator of heaven and earth, can reveal your identity to you. Because he is the one who created you. And you cannot understand that unless first you will get a revelation about who he is and the moment he gets a revelation Jesus says now let me tell you first of all I'm going to change your name who people think you are mm -mm. and also I'm going to give you the keys of my kingdom he does not give keys to just anybody why do you need keys if you're not going to open anything it's not just for a show it's not just for a show and tell when you go to your classmates and your school and you're like oh hey this is my toy my kids bring toys to school when it's a show and tell day this is not what it is Keen, keys of, to the kingdom are given to people that are actually gonna use them that are actually gonna go and set some captives free that are actually gonna go and say hey you were a sinner but now you are a saint saved by grace loved by your heavenly father and he is changing your name today You cannot get a revelation about who you truly are unless you get into his presence and you will be connected to his spirit and he will reveal his love to you first and who he is for you. This is the only way. And when we go through troubles like I said and we all go through them we all go through things and many some maybe some of you you're coming here and like Roman said maybe it's your last resort maybe you're like let me try this one thing I've tried everything everything seems to be falling apart everything seems to just 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 fall apart in my life whatever I touch it falls apart wherever I go troubles start and maybe this is your last resort but God says, if you truly get a revelation, how much I love you, that in the moments of afflictions, in the moments of troubles, when you cannot trace his hand, you will trust his heart. 
Because not always we see his hand. Not always we see things working even though they are. But when you know how much he loves you, then you can stare the death right in the eye and you can say, hey, you know what? Me being absent in my body is being present with the Lord. The best part about living is dying because I'm going to go into eternity and I'm going to spend time in his presence. I love him more than life. I love him more than my possessions. I I love him more than my children. I love him more than my husband. I love them more. I love him more than anything I have, than anything I possess. I love him more because my identity is not wrapped in those things. See, many people are afraid of dying. And I, I, I everybody, I was one of them. And last year, when I had to have surgery, I really discovered that I have this fear of dying. I've never been under anesthesia and all these stories started. You know, like if you're going through something, like all the naysayers and all the negative people just kind of find you for some reason. And they just kind of tell you the most horror stories that happened to those people. Like, hey, have you heard that when the so-and-so went under, they never woke up. And if they did wake up, something wasn't working. And you're like, man, I go home. And I truly discovered that I am afraid. I'm afraid. And I'm like, this is not normal. And God just spoke to me in that moment in my secret room, in my closet. He's like, Natasha, every sphere of your life where you are experiencing fear, you are lacking a revelation how much I love you. And if you are experiencing fear in any, any places or spheres of your life, it may be your children, you're afraid to have children, or you're afraid that your children will not serve the Lord, or you're afraid that you're going to get sick because sickness runs in your family, or you're afraid, listen, my mom and my dad died from cancer, but I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think so. This is not your address. You missed it. This is going to stop with me. This is going to stop on my bloodline in my family but but see when I experienced that fear I remember I went to my room and I'm like God give me a revelation how much you love me give me a why am I holding on to this life so much why why is it something that we all gonna die one day right I know it's sad I'm talking about dying but anyways it, it's gonna happen for some sooner for some later <clears throat> And I'm like, why am I so, like, holding on to this life? Why am I so afraid of dying? And when God told me that you are lacking revelation about how much I love you, because if you truly know how much you, he loves me and you, you don't care. You don't care. You don't care. And I remember I was, I was, you know, in my closet and I'm like, God, give me that revelation. In the sphere of, you know, having, going under anesthesia. I want to receive your revelation. How much you love me in this sphere of my life. Because when I go under anesthesia, even if I don't wake up, I will be present with the Lord. And I will never doubt his love for me. Fear is going to steal your faith. And I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know. I know we, we live in a fearful place right now. And, and a lot of negativity is happening. And a lot of things are, you know, going around the world. And wars and things are, that, that are happening. And, 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 and people that do not know their identity, they become inactive. Okay? They become inactive. Because they tell me this. Well, I heard a prophecy that wars will happen. And it's the end of the age. And, and the Jesus is coming. You, you, you should not be inactive. See, this kind, of, this kind of understanding makes you passive. You are not going to go and fight for souls. God's desire and God's will is for everyone to be saved. You don't know when he says everyone, it's everyone. This is all the will that you need to know. You don't need to guess. You don't need to think. Oh, well, if I tell them maybe, maybe they will receive Jesus. Maybe not. It's not for you to decide. You go and you fight for those people. You go and you pray your eyes out. You go and you scream so loud that you're going you're gonna to lose your voice. That when you get into your praying closet, the enemy is going to back up and say, uh-oh, she's coming again. He's coming again. He is coming to take.
tear down my kingdom. He is dangerous and she is dangerous because the only person that can be passive is the one that does not know their true identity. People that truly know who they are in Christ and how much God loves them, they will not sit back. They will not relax. They will not just enjoy and go with the flow. They're gonna go and they're gonna pluck her hell and they're gonna populate heaven because this is exactly the assignment and mission that Jesus anointed every single son and every single daughter not to be an active and passive, not to say, well, the somebody so and so said that 20 years from now this is gonna happen and hey it's happening no whatever they said you can go and you can open up his word and you can say what his word says that's why I'm telling you even good things even when they're gonna happen but if you know his heart and you know his word then you're gonna put those two together and you're gonna say God your will is for everyone to be saved your will is for everyone to be saved so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna testify about your goodness and about what you did for me Sometimes we think that people are just watching for us to fall. Oh, you don't know how many people are watching and, and sitting on the edges of their seats and like, man, if she'll make it, oh, if she'll make it, then maybe I have a chance that I'm gonna make it. Oh, if she came out of that hell, then I have a chance, a good one that I can come out of it as well. People are not just watching you to fail. People are watching for you to go and make it, to rise up from those ashes. No matter what you've been through, no matter your history, no matter your ethnicity, no matter where you came from, no matter your bloodline, your family, whatever it might be, it does not define you. Your possessions do not define you. Your position does not define you. The living God, the creator of heaven and earth, he defines you and he looks at you and he says, I love you. I love you to death. want to know how much he loves you he loves you to death and when I told you that there's so much tearing down happening and I feel that like stirring up in my spirit even as a as I was coming here I feel that I have to um, see how passionate I am I lost my voice and 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 I had that stirring up that God just started speaking to me he's like look at the oak tree and, um, and I'm like, okay, even Tanya asked me, she's like, what are you going to preach about? I'm like, I have nothing. The Lord just told me oak tree. She's like, oh, that's great. <laughs> preach on the oak tree. <clears throat> so I looked it up and, and they are the most um, oldest trees and the tallest trees. And um, do you know how deep their roots are? Who wants to take a wild guess? Vic, don't Google. <laughs> that giant that is standing for up to 1,000 or 2,000 years old. Their roots go down between three and five feet. That's interesting. Three and five feet. But then he's like, look further. And I start looking further. And the roots go wide between 75 and 250 feet. See, and that's when God stopped me. And he said, speak about unity do you know why they can stand and grow and withstand storms and 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 bad weather and drought is because their roots intertwine with one another okay and they, they hold one another up and even the baby ones when they are lacking sunshine 
because those giants standing over them that because their roots are all, all intertwined together the nutrients are being transferred to the little trees and God says see this is my body I know we compare sometimes the the body of of, of Christ is what the building that the foundation goes as 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 deep as as the actual building stands and God says but my body is a living body um, the building is dead but when the tree that oak tree is being planted first number one thing that happens is they grow deep and only after they grow deep they start spreading so God is speaking over his body today that first go deep in him and his love and then go wide with one another go wide with one another then whatever happens any storms whatever the enemy sends your roots are so together that you cannot tell which is which that whatever happens any wind any storms even the baby little tree those big giants will uphold because their roots are so intertwined with one another and you know those little trees can say well of course you're so big and you see the sunshine and you see all of that but but the big tree says you don't know what i have to endure to transfer those nutrients to you you don't know what i have to endure i get all the wind i get all the sun i get all of it and you just get the good stuff and the, another reason is that when they go so wide they can withstand drought they find water see we are meant to water one another the Bible says we need to build one another up this is his calling for the bride this is what he wants his body to do this is what he is speaking over you today that he wants you to help your sister that's on the right and the left of you but before you do that go deep in his love so you can be unshakable so you can be unmovable so you can help others so you can pluck her hell and populate heaven would we get up and stand on our feet right now and as we go into prayer I want to tell you that your identity if you are going through crisis if you are going through pain if you are going through moments in life that you do not understand and you cannot trace God's hand I want to invite you into discovering his heart trust his heart your identity is not found in your crisis it's in Christ your identity is not found in things your identity is not your past your identity is not the words of other people's or their opinions their validation does not define you mistakes don't define you if you made some bad mistakes in life if you mess up God says I look at you through my son Jesus and I see you holy and I see you in the right standing with me not because of your performance not because of what you did or did not do but because of Christ or what Christ did for you you just have to accept by faith what grace already provided for you just lay it down lay it down lay it down lay it down strip it away strip it away and when I said be authentic talk to God about your things talk to God if you've been you know hating on your sister or your brother maybe you are envious of someone because they have or seem to have more favor than you do God says I have a code for you I have a code for you 
Don't look at your brother's coat. Don't look at your sister's coat. I have one specially tailored and made just for you. just a regular fear if you're afraid of you know cutting yourself or or touching a hot stove that's a natural fear I'm talking about fear that you're afraid to go under anesthesia or that you're afraid to fly or that you are afraid of having children or you are afraid of being in ministry because you saw that someone was mistreated whatever it might be God says I want to love you today I want to love that fear out of you today if you are dealing with fear, I want you to come up here right now. We're going to have a prayer team that's going to minister to you. That's going to minister to you. Whatever it might be, whatever it might be, any fear is not of God. There is no fear. The perfect love will cast out that fear out of you. If you are afraid of living, if you are afraid of getting sick, if you are afraid of giving, even trusting God, giving your life to Jesus, I want prayer team to start praying over these people. fear out of them right now God I pray for every single woman right now Lord that is facing some fearful situations that is facing fear right now God father right now I'm asking you that you're gonna reveal your love to them God love that fear out of them love the devil out of them God I ask you right now that you will reveal your love to your daughters you love them how you see them what you are thinking over them God the thoughts that you are thinking over them Lord speak to them father speak to your daughters speak to your daughters and fear I command you to lose your daughters right now I come against the spirit of fear I come against the spirit of fear I bind you and I cast you out you have no right to be in your daughter's lives you have no right to be in your daughter's lives I cast you out in the name of Jesus I cast you out go in the name of Jesus go in the name of Jesus struggling 
just like Joseph's brothers did. They were struggling, but they did not know they were struggling. If you are dealing with comparison, if you are dealing with some things, if you cannot stand someone in your life, or if you cannot receive someone, God wants to break that off of you today. I want to invite you to find a person or two, and I want you to tell them what you are facing with. And I want you to invite Jesus into that moment in your place and a place in your heart. And I want you to be vulnerable and I want you to be open so you can receive from God. Find a person or two and say, listen, I have this problem. I don't want to feel this way. I no longer want to deal with this. I want to leave this here and now. I want to go home changed. I want to go home transformed. This is not who I am. I am a daughter and I am a beloved daughter of God. Find that person. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter if they know you or not. Find that person. Doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a leader. They do not define you. Those things do not define you. You're just a daughter standing next to another daughter and sharing your heart so God can set you free today. Father, I pray over every single person Person that might be struggling with identity, that might be going through identity crisis, that might be allowing devil to steal the God-given identity in their life. Lord, I pray today for every single body, God, local body, God, global body of Christ. Father, right now we stand and we say no to tearing down and we say yes to building up. We say yes to building up. We're going to build your house, God. Father, forgive us for every single time. God, when we tear someone's coat down just because it was brighter than us, just because it was better than ours, Father, right now I ask you that you will forgive us for tearing someone down, that you're going to forgive us for doing things like that, Lord. God, this is not who we are, and this is not who you called us to be. God, we are deeply loved by you. Every single one of us. Every single one of us, Jesus. Father, strip away 